Miss Sweta. Yes, sir. How's your day? It has been good, sir. Uh, tell us something about uh, the place where you come from. Sir, I come from Hyderabad, and Hyderabad is uh, the fastest-growing metropolitan city currently, and we have a diverse culture. It is very famous for its food. Example, the Hyderabadi biryani, which is world famous, and also it is called as the city of pearls, and it has a diverse range of industries, and it is also uh, a software hub and a cosmopolitan culture. I would say it is called as the Ganga Jamuni Tehsil because people from different relig religions, cultures. languages get along with each other very well mm -hmm. so i am proud to be a hyderabadi sir okay good why did you choose to become a civil servant sir i consider civil services to be a profession which can give me a diversity of work profile and i can contribute to the society and also it is a good it provides me good financial stability and security so considering all these aspects i chose uh, civil services to be a career uh, are you aware of national strategy on artificial intelligence yes sir uh, can you tell some important ideas related to it yes sir uh, national strategy on artificial intelligence has been uh, published by niti ayog a think tank it aims to give an outline or road map for the future course of the policy which indian ai uh, companies should take up like the areas or sectors in which it should be promoted currently it does not prov uh, provide any regulations as such uh, only a road map and the direction is shown by the strategy yeah. but uh, i am more interested in the ideas which are highlighted in it how is your knowledge as a data engineer uh, can help you in 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 your administration you have an experience of working as a yes sir yes sir i think my knowledge uh, as a software engineer will help me to use the utilize the leverage the power of data in administration in every field of work as we are saying data is the new oil it can be used as a raw material to find out to find out the uh, loopholes or gaps in our policy framework and if the welfare schemes which the government is implementing has it been reaching the targeted target audience or not and also to find out which are the possible areas which can have multiplier effects uh, for example if we focus on women empowerment the the effects can be seen in diverse areas some reports have said that making women a partner in development can increase our gdp growth it will have ripple effects on education of the of the next generation and health and so on so it will give a clearer picture about what should be done and it can also help in rationalizing the current policies sir mm -hmm. okay is there any policy and data in india sir uh, data digital data protection act has been passed in the in 2023 and uh, digital governance policy is also present sir mm -hmm. okay what is personally identifiable information and what is non personally identifiable information also what is the difference between sensitive and non sensitive personally identifiable information sir any information which can which helps one to identify a particular person for example a person's name date of birth his address and so on can be categorized as personal information on the contrary non personal information is something 
which does not directly help in distinguishing a person. For example, some person has purchased some products on e-commerce. What the product is, what is the product being purchased, so on. That is not specifically personal data. That is non-personal data. And uh, coming to sensitive data, uh, information like a person's health records, his uh, disease profile, his, uh, his or her uh, sexual identity, sexual orientation, these are sensitive data. Yeah, what is non-sensitive? Non-sensitive is uh, any data which can not be particularly used to harm or to judge a person or cannot be used in any negative possible way for any person. Okay. <clears throat> what is digital public infrastructure and what is its importance? So, uh, digital in public infrastructure, the best example I can uh, quote for that is the UPI currently which has spread widely across India. Um, similarly, there are many uh, digital tools, uh, especially if we see the COVID, during the COVID pandemic, many apps were used. So, uh, I'm unable to recollect the app, Covin, sorry. Okay, no. Co Covin, Covin portal was used so that uh, all in, all India uniformity, digi uh, digital records of vaccination and uh, movement of people could be traced at a single portal. And uh, also uh, DigiLocker, digi where we can store our documents and which which are acceptable uh, across India and uh, Aadhaar, the linkage of Aadhaar and our bank accounts, all this comes under digital public infrastructure, which is which has helped linking and identifying people and also providing them services in an efficient manner. So one more example is DBT through which uh, the welfare scheme benefits are reaching directly to the targeted audience and we are all we have also successfully reduced the leakage issue which was previously present okay tell us more more about your night in the town award sir uh, so night on the town award was given for my good performance on a quarterly basis so i was involved in a project where it was a new project where we were supposed to bring uh, cloud data onto the, originally uh, Teradata, the company I worked in, had their original data warehouse product and they served, their, uh, they served the customer's data on their own hardware systems. But as customers were slowly progressing towards cloud and the whole of the data was uh, stored in cloud. So the customers were, uh, they, they were kind of demanding a mechanism for which data from cloud could also be retrieved to the local database and then they could run the applications which they needed. So I uh, I was part of a two member team. Uh, we developed a prototype to show that this could be done. And for that, uh, for that I was given this award. So. Okay. If you are the commissioner of police, how do you assess? If a town is safe for women to roam freely at night? Uh, firstly, I would like to ensure that there are multiple <coughs> patrolling vehicles in each area for continuous monitoring of the, of the specific area. And also, I would like to provide all public transport systems and cabs, autos with a panic button so that women could use that in case of any emergency and this alerts the local police. Sir, so, uh, third, third step would be to, uh, to educate women that all of them have, all of them installs an app on their mobile phone. Uh, I think in Telangana, we have an app called Hawkeye. Using that app, they can directly alert uh, the police stations and yes so these are the steps i can recollect okay. as of now mention various initiatives taken by government of india to promote menstrual hygiene sir under swachh bharat mission uh, toilets have been 
are being constructed for women this improves their uh, menstrual hygiene or hygiene and also uh, the school infrastructure the construction of toilets and separate uh, toilets for women also help in improving menstrual hygiene initiatives taken listen questions carefully okay okay sir. initiatives taken by government if you are a district collector posted in a district with a high incidence of cervical cancers suggest me five most important interventions you would take to promote menstrual hygiene first step would be to start a vaccination drive for hpv vaccines especially for girls in the age in the classes of 5th to 8th as has also been highlighted in the recent budget so i would like to provide the infrastructure and uh, arrange the supply of these vaccines first thing is and second thing all the girls and mothers in my district needs to be educated about the dangers and the chances of uh, cervical cancer third step would be to educate them about safe uh, hygienic menstrual hygiene uh, practices like uh, the use of uh, sanitary napkins and and which are biodegradable and fourth one would be to to arrange a drive with the collaboration of ngos or women self help groups where we can distribute biodegradable and safe sanitary uh, napkins for girls it's okay not an issue uh, what are the various factors responsible for poor menstrual hygiene and what are the outcomes of poor menstrual hygiene so, so factors responsible and outcomes right factors responsible for poor health are lack of awareness how what are the safe uh, menstrual health practices which should be adopted and some reports have highlighted that more than 40% of the people do not properly understand this menstrual cycles and the practices should be which should be adopted before their menarch so this is the major uh, factor and also the taboo and stigma around discussion about uh menstrual cycles is one other factor and lack of infrastructure like uh, proper toilets and availability of uh, menstrual products is one more factor sir and uh, the impacts are widespread like uh, cervical cancer has also been identified as uh, one of the negative impact of bad menstrual practices sexually trans transferred infections are one more thing overall reproductive health of women takes a hit because of unsafe uh, menstrual practices and also because uh, because of lack of infrastructure there is why there is a drop out among girls in schools or educational institutions and also parents parents uh, want their girl child not to go to school during uh, the menstrual cycles so hmm. all these are effects of okay good do you think indian culture promotes menstrual hygiene or not if so mention with examples sir i think indian culture does promote uh, safe menstrual hygiene for example uh, traditionally uh, biodegradable uh, sanitary napkins were used as part of our culture which is coming back uh, which we are seeing now in use which is being promoted so i think that is one practice which was good but uh, lack of communication and highlighting the importance of those and uh, and proper discussion about it has led to uh, led to a stage where we are kind of a little bit forgetting what what is the importance of those so we need to bring it back i think okay Uniform Civil Code of Uttarakhand prescribes mandatory registration of live-in relationship. Yes, sir. So, what's your take on this, Shweta? Sir, uh, I'm not in favor of mandatory registration of live-in relationships. Uh, firstly, because it impinges on the privacy of a couple. I feel, and also the provisions of uh, UCC in Uttarakhand. give the permission to permission for moral policing i would say the society and neighbors can complain to registrar uh, which who will be appointed under this civil law and 
this uh, this impinges on their privacy and also impinges on privacy and also it uh, women's safety will take a hit sir mm-hmm. i think uh, to the contrary it should be left for the individuals to decide if they want to register and also women should be made aware of the benefits which they will get after registration because this bill provides that uh, the children born out of living relationships will be protected under the law and women will be protected so they should be made, made aware of these benefits and also ensuring that their data will be kept confidential might encourage the couples to seek um, registration on their own without any imposition from the state so what is the necessity of uniform civil code because uttarakhand has now brought it yes um gujarat is considering and i think madhya pradesh also is contemplating yes sir. several states are uh, uh, working uh, on following the suit why what is the necessity sir uh, i think in our directive principles of state policy article 44 we have uh, uh, we have the mention of civil code and also some religious practices regarding marriage are discriminatory towards women to provide them relief from those practices ucc is required for example in islam polygamy uh, practices like polygamy nikah halala are uh, still discriminatory towards women and they impinge on their rights to equality and uh, right to freedom of life and personal dignity so i think in those practices disc- uh, removing those discriminatory practices is required to provide them the respect they de- they deserve okay shweta does india have any strategic influence on the indian ocean yes sir india does have a huge strategic influence on indian ocean being one of the largest countries surrounding indian ocean it exerts influence and also it uh, india has a huge impact on the neighboring countries surrounding uh, indian ocean it india provides india provides a uh, financial aid and also secu- it india is a net security provider in the indian ocean region mm-hmm. okay oh. states welcome private investors yes is it we have seen of late uh, um, chief ministers themselves going to davos summits yes and uh, state uh, organizing investor summits all these things yes but the same state governments resist disinvestment why this policy inconsistency sir i think uh, political reasons are one of the factor Uh, for this inconsistency because public sector enterprises employ a, a significant chunk of population and the and uh, psc jobs provide security so uh, like hesitancy and anger among the public when these psc's are closed leads uh, leads the governments to resist the push for disinvestment so okay what are small and modular reactors and what are the possible benefits of their adoption i'm not exactly sure it's okay why are south indian states like tamil nadu kerala karnataka they are not happy with the central government and is there a justification for their protest so south indian states are uh, particularly against central government because the devolution of tax revenue from the center has been less compared to the the tax revenue which states have been contributing towards the whole pool of revenue because of the formula decided by finance commission 41% of uh, whole tax and non tax revenue is being devolved to all the states and 
the the formula uh, behind the formula behind this devolution takes into account the income distance and it it provides a larger chunk of revenue to those states which are, which have deficit revenue and which needs uh, which needs the devolution to fund their development activities as the southern states have been doing considerably better than the north indian states they have uh, received less chunk compared to north indian states and this is be this has be, uh, this is the underlying reason for pushback from the south indian states okay. is that the only reason and one more reason is south indian states have been successful in limiting the population growth on the whole so the representation of south indian states in lok sabha seats has become less and if the delimitation exercise which is being planned soon if that happens south indian states will further lose their representation in lok sabha this is also one of the bone of contention sir so what how do how should we address this delimitation issue hope you understood the question yes sir sir i think uh, states representation and states representation should be protected but also we need a delimitation exercise because currently the number of seats are based on 1971 census and there has been huge demographic changes across the country so we need uh, we need to ensure that one vote one value one person is maintained in lok sabha that's why i think we need delimitation but at the same time to protect the interest of all the states maybe we should consider some amendments or changes in the composition of rajya sabha like in usa all states have equal representation in uh, in senate all each state has two representatives irrespective of the size maybe we can consider something like that and also devolving uh, decentralization like shifting some of the powers in from union list to state list and increasing the number of mlas on the states uh, might reduce the conflict sir but sweta if there are more number of seats in north india do you think politically they will be more powerful because they are more representative and most often the we end up getting prime ministers from north india or most of on the agendas or areas of interest related to north india would be legislated so i think we should uh, consider the idea of india as a whole rather than building this construct of north versus no, no, this south is, this is all philosophy let's talk practically yes so even if we look at the long term if south india develops at a faster pace and more and north india doesn't in future it it can lead to conflicts and there can be a huge influx of migrants and communal conflicts these can take place so i think it's in the overall interest of the country and everyone to also south indian states should not question much so uh, they should question and also we can uh, consider some changes in the tax devolution for example in the recent uh, 15th finance commission report for example in for telangana and karnataka okay. if you are the district collector of a predominantly forest dense district with a high incidence of human animal conflict okay suggest me five most important interventions you would undertake okay so the first and uh, first and foremost thing should be to properly demarcate and delineate the areas with higher concentration of wildlife and secondly we should ensure that the disturbance to this region is minimal from any human intervention in these regions should be minimal and using technology we can we can study the movement of wild animals and alert the local local forest officials if there has been any breach of uh, the demarcated territories by wild animals or humans and also employing locals who are 
who are traditionally proficient in dealing with wild animals uh, for example we we saw the documentary elephant whisperers where local tribal people who who are who are uh, comfortable and who know how to handle with wild animals who used f- for uh, to protect them and also raise them such measures should be considered uh, suggest some reforms to the institution of election commission even after the recently passed act which provides a mechanism for uh, qualification and the mechanism for election or and appointment of chief election commissioner we have seen that the team comprises of prime minister of india leader of opposition and one cabinet minister so the role of judiciary is missing in this committee Are so sure? i think yes sir right. so the role of judiciary should also be included i feel to provide uh, proper checks and balances and uh, for more for a transparent and accountable appointment of chief election commissioner and uh, secondly chief election commission should be given its own staff and administrative uh, funding for election currently they are dependent on central government staff and for more uh, integrity integral conduct of elections a separate staff of their own can help and election com- uh, election commission should be given more powers to enforce uh, punishments for violation of model code of conduct and supreme court has uh, passed some guidelines which instruct the can- which instruct the political parties to cite a reason why they have given tickets to persons who have a criminal cases against them those are not being followed uh, strict powers should be given to election commission to uh, disqualify the candidates who violate these guidelines okay why should we promote the concept of micro credentials in higher education of india i think the concept of micro credentials will help students to acquire the skills which they are more interested in and utilize the skills for employment opportunities rather than spending their time and money on a whole four years or three years of course in which they are not interested and they are uh, forced to acquire the degree just for the sake of it mm-hmm. i think micro credentials will provide flexibility to them they can choose the time and uh, course of their choice as they are more interested they will acquire the skills well and use this for their uh, financial security okay our scheduled cast a homogeneous group or heterogeneous group why did this debate arise in the first place sir if we consider today scheduled cast are not uh, homogeneous i would say since independence scheduled cast are provided reservation benefits with the aim to bring them at a, at par with other groups in our society what we have observed recently and from studies is that only 20% of those families or groups are taking advantage of the reservations and these families have climbed the socio economic ladder but not all of them so uh, that's why we we see that some scheduled caste are well ahead of others in terms of their literacy their participation in uh, government uh, government jobs and higher education also so so that's why uh, i think our chief justice of india has recently talked about categorization of scheduled caste and adjusting the reservation benefits accordingly to bring uh, to so that all uh, the caste which have not yet benefited also develop and uh, reach the level of others okay you are done with your interview mishweta thank, thank you, you. Thank you.